lovely to see familiar names. Um, as we all know, the lockdown has started again in the UK. If uh, you are from overseas, welcome. Um, if you're not actually as sure or have heard of Water Skills Academy, just a little bit of a brief rundown as to what we do. Um, during the lockdown, the last lockdown in the UK, we decided that we would try to engage uh, the SUP audience by putting on a series of free uh, Friday webinars. And this is this is a, a pickup from, from the last lockdown. Um, and we also uh, ran some paid webinars as well. And the free webinars, if you are interested in what we actually presented, are available on the Water Skills Academy website. If you click on our YouTube link, um, so tonight's one is a free session. So if you do have to leave early, um, it will be uploaded to the YouTube, uh, our YouTube. That give us a couple of days, but um, generally it's pretty quick. And tonight's session is all about um, safety for open water and coastal paddling for stand-up paddleboarders. It is going to be followed by a, a course that Steve will be running um, for four Wednesdays, starting next Wednesday. So if you're interested in that, if you've liked what you see tonight, be great to see you um, join the course which starts uh, next Wednesday. All, all of the information is on our um, on our uh, website as well, on our Facebook pages. So Water Skills Academy, just very briefly, uh, we're a members organisation. We specialise in doing instructor training with a big focus on stand-up paddleboarding. Uh, we also do uh, lifeguard training, surf instructor training, and we run some pretty wonderful adventure uh, stand-up paddleboard adventure trips to wonderful locations like Nepal, Norway and Scotland. So if you're interested in those, uh, check us out. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Steve, uh, just a little bit of um, housework before we start. Um, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to put to Steve, could you please use the Q&A tab uh, rather than the chat function. If you're new to Zoom, um, if you hover your cursor over the bottom of your screen, it should, should bring it up. Um, and we can answer those. And we can put some questions to Steve as well at the end of the presentation or during the presentation um, if we feel that they're, they need to be asked right at that time. Um, if you can also make sure that your microphone button is muted, that would be fantastic. So I hope you enjoy it. Schedules for about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and I'll hand over to Steve. So over to you, Steve. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I, the, the timing, uh, uh, this is a, a new presentation, so it's not been done before. So we'll, we'll have to suck it and see with the timing a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Steve Bowens. I live in uh, uh, Cornwall, in the southwest of England. And I've just seen in the chat, there's some pre pretty international uh, audience, which is amazing. Um, I'm from Northern Ireland originally, and I have uh, I grew up uh, in and around the sea. Uh, and I spend uh, um, my working time, I spend quite a lot of it uh, around uh, the, the water and uh, my leisure time as much as, as I can in and around the water as well. Um, I'm, uh, I've been paddleboarding uh, for a few years uh, and, and love it. I love the opportunity to explore. I, I especially love the view that it gives you and the accessibility to parts of the coastline. And Chris just mentioned like some of the, the WSA expedition courses going to far off bases. Well, just behind me, if you can see it, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, I was working up in Scotland. I went for a paddle uh, and uh, my ice up folds up, sits in the back of the van, and if I'm working somewhere that's nice, I can unroll it and I can go for a paddle. And this is um, this is the photo as it's taken. It's not touched up, anything like that. Uh, this is the Coolin uh, Ridge behind me. If uh, there's any climbers in the audience, you'll probably have heard of, certainly from the UK, you'll certainly know the Coolin Ridge uh, and that's on the Isle of Skye. Uh, so uh, I think paddleboarding is an amazing opportunity to get out and explore these places. Um, and uh, although it is pretty calm there, that, that particular picture, that set of circumstances is pretty unusual for Scotland and for Sky generally, especially the West Coast. Um, so tonight um, uh, we're going to be talking uh, about a little bit about things that you might want to consider if you're going to be getting into stand-up paddleboarding on the sea or in open water. So it's not really a, an in-depth uh, advanced um, consideration, 
but um, we're going to think about things like the environment we're going into and, and how we can make good decisions before we head out. Um, uh, as well as a bit of paddleboarding um, in terms of this, the environment and understanding of it. I've, um, I've done a few different things in sea. So I've, I rode across the Atlantic in 2012. Uh, I've done a, a few kind of long distance kayak expeditions, um, just over 600 miles, going past this actually, um, taking in the Outer Hebrides uh, uh, in Scotland and bits and pieces like that. So uh, I spent a reasonable amount of time in the environment. And so my, my knowledge is predominantly from practical application uh, as much as anything. I just just going to share my screen with you so it can guide us through this here. Okay, so this evening's uh, session uh, has been sort of put out there as sub safety for open water um, paddling, open water stand up paddling. Um, and the, uh, the idea is to give a brief overview of topics relevant to a newbie stand up paddle. And an opportunity for me to show off some of my uh, little uh, photos and videos as we as we go along. Um, and most of these were taken, actually all of these little clips were taken just um, just this summer. Steve, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're, uh, could okay. you could repeat that. Sorry about that, because you, your music was playing over your... Uh... <laughs> Voice. It was too loud. Yeah, so ju just to, to say that uh, the little photos and videos and stuff that were just up on there were just this summer and they're all in the sea and they're all uh, done by uh, Stand Up Paddleboard. So the first part of the, this evening, we're going to think a little bit about weather uh, and, uh, and uh, a look at what the forecast is and what that might mean to us if we're planning to go uh, paddling. So the first thing is, this is actually the forecast for where I live in Cornwall uh, for tomorrow. So if I was thinking about going paddling tomorrow, incidentally, I'm, I'm not, in case any of you are wondering, um, I, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but this is the Met Office forecast. And people often ask, well, what's the best forecast to use um, if I'm going paddling or surfing, whatever it is? And, and my... Uh, response is always the same it, it is the forecast that you use consistently plus all the other ones that you use consistently so the more information you can gather gather the better because that builds up a really good picture and understanding about what's happening in the environment so this is the for tomorrow uh, around this sort of time of day that you might be going paddling because obviously the evenings are closing in in the uk here um the cloud cover is uh, not that important perhaps. Um, chance of precipitation, so rain that is important because it has an impact on uh, visibility. Uh, the temperature uh, is an important aspect to consider in terms of what we're gonna wear when we go out onto the water. And actually it's, it's saying here that's relatively mild, but keep in mind that the next part of the temperature is what it feels like, including the wind chill. And so at the end, we'll talk a little bit about what we're gonna wear when we're out in the water, but, but a, a wetsuit, which is probably the most common thing to wear, if you're going out on the sea and it's windy and flat, may or may not be the best thing to wear. The most important part of this, I think, is actually the wind strength and direction. Uh, and if we look along here, you can see that it is uh, east, southeast or southeast. And the southeast means that's where the wind is coming from, not going to. And that can confuse people often. Um, so if you imagine the ship of Cornwall, uh, that would be blowing directly away from the land, which is known as an offshore wind. Uh, and on a paddleboard, we are like a massive seal. Uh, and, and the board, unlike a, a yacht or a boat, doesn't have a keel in it. It has a fin, but it hasn't really got any lateral resistance. So a not strong offshore like, like that, offshore, offshore wind like that, uh, would be very problematic. And you can see that that is the sort of consistent wind, and then there's gusts of up to 35 miles an hour. So that's uh, more wind than, than uh, anybody really should be heading out on a paddleboard. Uh, the visibility is, is good um, and the humidity and UV is not that relevant uh, at this time of the year here. Where does this all this information come from? Well, it comes from um, uh, an interpretation of what pressure systems are doing all around the world. And, and a brief explanation of that is that our weather comes from, let me just change the view. Um, because the sun is heating up the earth. And as it does so,
the sun, and I brought the sun with me at no expense spared, heats up the earth, but it actually heats up the equator much more um, than the poles. That's why the North Pole and the South Pole are covered in ice, because actually the heat from the sun is going past that area. So where it gets hot, um, we have hot air that rises. And as that air comes away from the land, it creates a low pressure because it's lifting away. It goes up into the sky and it comes back down. It presses on the earth and it creates a high pressure. And so we have these difference in pressures because the air, which is heating up and cooling down, is trying to equalize from the poles to the equator. And so we have this kind of movement of air going around and that creates our wind and our, and our weather systems. Combined with the fact that we have the heating, the unequal heating, the earth is spinning as well and that causes um, the air to move in a circular motion. So what that looks like, if we look at this, which is a weather chart or a synoptic chart, you can see that here is Ireland and the mainland UK over here. And up into the North Atlantic, we have this big dartboard, a big low pressure. And where you have that air going up into the atmosphere, uh, we have low pressures and that creates quite a lot of wind. And the wind is going around this low pressure in an anti-clockwise direction. So all these lines, this looks pretty complicated if you, if you don't look at it all, all that often, but, but really these lines are just bands of equal pressure. And if they're close to the pressure gradient is greater and therefore there's more wind. And where we have lots of lines together, that's generating lots of wind. And you can see here, uh, just uh, th these lines around, um, just to the west of the UK and Ireland, are really close together and they're traveling a long way. And this is actually the forecast from last week when we in the UK uh, experienced some very, very large uh, waves. Um, you can see that the lines are going in a straight line, they're close together and they're traveling a big distance. So that's gonna affect our choice of location to go paddling in two ways. One, that's gonna be very, very windy. And if we were anywhere on the West Coast, we'd be blown back towards the shore. Um, but also, more important than that, it's going to generate mass um, because we have all this wind pushing, pushing those waves along. So I mentioned at the start that forecast uh, is useful uh, if we take several different types of forecasts. And one of the ones that's probably the most useful uh, when we're paddleboarding is to look at the marine forecast. And there's two types of marine forecast uh, which you get. One is the shipping areas forecast, which is here on the right hand side. And it breaks um, the, uh, the ocean up in partic into particular regions like Biscay, Lundy, Fastnet, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. They're not that they can be useful if you uh, if you if you learn a lot more about the forecast. But generally, if we are looking tonight at where we're going to go paddling tomorrow, the more relevant forecast is the inshore waters forecast, because that tells us over a period of time what the forecast, what the weather is likely to do up to 12 miles offshore. If you're paddling more than 12 miles offshore, then you are a more advanced paddler than this presentation is perhaps aimed at. <laughs> The inshore for waters forecast, it, it, it's, um, it's updated four times during the day. So it's really, really up to date. It comes out at midnight, six o'clock in the morning, midday, and then six o'clock in the afternoon as well. Um, and it divides sea areas up into 19 particular areas. So you can look at where you are um, and see what sea area it might affect. And it's actually, it, when you read it, it sounds really general, but it's actually, it's actually very detailed indeed. Every word within the inshore waters forecast has a very specific meaning. And the first thing to understand is, is the wind strength, because I think for paddling, that's one of the things that's going to have impact on us when we, when we go paddling. And the wind strength, when we looked at the Met Office forecast at the start, um, it gave us the wind strength in miles per hour. And over a period of time, that's useful because you get to understand how that affects you. But I think actually a more um, uh, relevant consideration for the wind is the Beaufort scale. Um, Francis Beaufort was a Royal Navy officer uh, and he devised this scale in 1805. So it's been around for quite a long time. Uh, that's not really important, but what is important is that Beaufort scale gives you a visual indication 
of wind strength. So when you look out the window and you look at the trees and you look at how they're moving, that is a direct correlation to the wind strength in miles an hour, kilometers an hour, or nautical miles an hour, which are a, a nautical mile is slightly long, uh, longer than the land mile. Uh, and, it, and it's really, really useful and really, really good to get an idea of what the Beaufort scale actually looks like when you are going to go paddling. And you can see here, this is, this is the scale here. It goes from force to zero all the way up to force 12. Um, I don't know how many people go paddling in force 12. Um, but on the um, right hand side of the screen here, this is a specification. It gives it a verbal description of what that looks like. And I, this hasn't come from any books or, or I haven't taken advice on this, but it's my own kind of opinion uh, that for stand up paddle boarding up to force two, it, it is okay. Um, you can paddle, you can generally paddle against a force two if you're a, a even, you know, if you're a competent paddler who is staying on their feet um, and managing to paddle even when it's a bit choppy. But once you get above a force two into force three, Three, which is an hour uh, or um, 12 to 19 kilometers an hour, it's a, at best, it's not very comfortable. Uh, and at worst, you may not be able to paddle against it. And the key thing for me um, is that that's really, uh, you really notice on the sea is whenever this you get to a, a force four. A force four is where you are getting white horses. So you're getting white capping on the sea. Now you have to also keep in mind that when you get to the beach or wherever you're going, that if the wind is blowing away from the shore, if it's blowing offshore, those white cats might not be visible. So it may appear to be really uh, light winds and gentle when you get on the, on the beach, but if the wind is blowing offshore, the further you go from the beach, the less resistance there is to that wind and the stronger it will become. And actually, unfortunately, that causes and has caused a, a number of paddle boarders to get into quite significant uh, difficulties. Um, when it talks about time in the intro waters forecast, again, these are very specific terms. So imminent means less than six hours. Soon is less than 12 hours. Later is after more than 12 hours when it's talking about this. We're gonna look at forecast just now. And then when it says backing and veering, that's relation to the wind. Backing means that the wind direction is going to go in a clockwise fashion, uh, anti-clockwise fashion, and veering is the, uh, sorry, backing is going anti-clockwise and veering is going uh, clockwise. So it's change in direction. And then finally, the C state um, is an indication of the wave height. So it can go slight up to very high and wave heights of half a meter to 1.5 meters um, and smooth is less than 0.5 meters. And, and if there's, if those of you who are, you know, thinking about going out into open water or along the coast for the first time, I would certainly be looking at a forecast that says smooth because actually paddle boarding when it's choppy is quite hard to do. And the choppier it gets, often that's related to stronger winds so you have a double whammy. You end up with a, being on a board which is unstable to stand on uh, and therefore you can't generate much power when you're paddling and you've got an increase in wind strength. So that's a, 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 an important consideration. The other thing is visibility. This is the cooling ridge in the background. <laughs> um, Again, it has very specific terminology. So very poor as, in, uh, as to um, two nautical miles. Uh, and I would suggest that if you're heading out on the coast uh, or in a uh, body of water, that you would really want a moderate or good or very good visibility um, so that you can see where you're going. And uh, years ago, I, I used to do a lot of wind, quite a lot of windsurfing and, and compete in it. And, and a friend of mine, a, a chap said to me, every time you leave the beach, look back because it never looks the same whenever you're on the sea. And, it, and I've taken that with me ever since. Um, when you're paddling out from wherever you go, make sure you look behind you because it's very easy, especially along the coast, to forget or not understand where you're trying to get back to. But that's only useful if you can see. <laughs> so we need to have reasonably good visibility when we're heading out. This is the fork I, I was doing today's inshore forecast, try and find somewhere that I would maybe consider going paddling if I had 
uh, access and freedom to go anywhere in the UK. And it was pretty hard today because we've got pretty unsettled weather. But the forecast for today, uh, I would suggest um, that this would be one to perhaps look at. This is from Cape Wrath to basically Aberdeen. So it's, it's this area across to here. So it's this sea area over here. This is the Moray Coast uh, along here, Inverness in here, uh, and John O'Groats up that way. And for the next 24 hours, it's saying the wind is south or southwest. So that means the wind is coming, if we were on the Moray coast, the wind is coming from the south and it's going north. So it's an offshore wind along this coastline here. Um, it's uh, south or southwest three to five. So that means actually it's kind of on the border up in terms of the wind strength. And uh, three to five, if you were... Uh, not in a sheltered area, that would be too strong to paddle in. And then it's become, become invariable two to four, which means it's swinging round a bit side to side uh, and dropping off a bit. The sea state is rough or very rough, northwest of Orkney, but that's up here. So if we were going to go paddling on the Murray coast, that's not really going to affect us. But if you look at it, it says it's slight or smooth in the Murray Firth. So it's saying slight or smooth, uh, which is pretty useful. Uh, occasional rain or drizzle, and the visibility is moderate or good, occasionally poor. So there isn't anywhere in the UK that's particularly great for paddleboarding tomorrow. <laughs> but if I had to choose somewhere, I would probably go to Beaufort, well, Port Nocky, uh, and maybe visit Beaufort Rock. You can see from the landscape in the background that there's, there's big cliffs around there. There's plenty of little spots you can get out. And because we're on the north coast, the wind's blowing offshore, we'll be sheltered from that wind. But I, I would only go there because I, I feel like I'm a relatively experienced paddler and I would go with other people uh, and I would certainly check the conditions when I got there before I, I paddled out because it is a, a fairly strong offshore wind. The other thing we need to think about is the tides and how they might affect us. Uh, and I've got a very brief story to share with you. And this is a, a true story. Uh, I two friends um, during the summer who went paddleboarding. Uh, this is the, the village I live in, which is Portreath. This is the beach here. And this is the north coast of Cornwall. So as you look at it, that is an aerial view and that is how it looks. So the, the beach actually faces northwest. These guys wanted to go uh, and have lunch at a place called Bassett's Cove, which is just up. And as you can see from here, it's nearly two and a half kilometers up the coast. And these guys had done a reasonable amount of paddling before. They didn't check the forecast. And when they got down to the beach, it was sunny. It was, the, the water was flat and it looked perfect conditions. They paddled out off the beach at half nine in the morning uh, and high tide was at 10 o'clock. So when they left, this, this image is with the, the beach at low tide. So when they left, they paddled out uh, and their plan was to go paddle along the coast, drop into uh, a little cove here, which is a beautiful, uh, frying pan ship cove and then carry on to Bassett's, uh, have their pet lunch and then come back again. Not a particularly long distance. Um, we've got big cliffs along here, a beautiful paddle and they they did manage to do the paddle but it wasn't particularly pleasant. Um, the forecast actually if they had looked at it was a southwesterly so that's coming from the bottom left hand side of the screen in this direction. So the wind was going against them. As soon as they came out of the beach, they came around the corner, they get hit by the wind. The reason there was no wind when they left was because they had these big cliffs to protect them. So actually in the bay, in the beach, it was really calm. But as soon as they got around the headland, they were faced with this uh, strong wind. They had a lovely paddle along here, except it was really hard into the wind. Uh, and when they got to Bastard's Cove, it wasn't there because high tide and around and come all the way back again. And they learned a valuable lesson in that. The other thing was that when they, when they were paddling back again, the tide was against them. The tide was moving from the northwest going southwest. And that meant that on the way back, it was very, very rough, or, or they considered it to be very rough. So planning to go for your paddle, understanding what the forecast is, is really important. And the next thing to understand is a little bit more about tides. And, and, the, and the key thing about tides is there's two types of tidal movement. There's up-down movement, which is called tidal range. And you can see that in the bottom diagram here. And the reason that they couldn't stop at Bassett's Cove or there was nowhere to stop was because it was high tide. And so 
that tidal range is the vertical movement up and down. And, and people often consider that the tide comes in and goes out. It doesn't really work like that. What happens is the tide gets deeper and it gets shallower. So in a bay, um, the, when it's high tide, it may cut off particular areas. So if you go uh, around the corner and you leave your stuff around the corner, uh, you might get cut off from that. Or you might leave the beach uh, and leave your stuff on the beach. And when you come back, it's gone because it's been washed away by the tide. The other tidal movement, which is also important to understand is that as well as an up-down movement, which is the, the vertical distance is measured in meters, it was a long. So the story I've just given you is from Portreath, which is in the north coast of Cornwall here. And an incoming tide actually comes from the southwest. It hits Land's End here and it goes up the coast towards the Bristol Channel. It also splits off and goes along the south coast. So, so the tide doesn't come towards the land and go away from the land. It goes past the land. So as the tide comes in, we have in an incoming, or known as a flood tide, the tide goes up the English Channel um, towards Dover, but it also goes up the Irish Channel uh, towards Wales. Now that's important because if we're going to go for a paddle, and we're going to paddle southwest, so if we're paddling from uh, Portreath and you're going towards uh, Land's End that way, if the tide's coming in, if the tide's rising, you're paddling against the tide. Now that's okay because if you get tired or you don't want to carry on, you can turn around, you've got the tide behind you, that's going to be a benefit to you. Um, or a, a better way to do it would be if you go for a, for a journey uh, and you might be going a few kilometers, is actually to go A to B. But understanding the direction of the tide will have a big impact on you because if the tide is ebbing, that means the tide's dropping and you leave uh, our village Patrith and you head towards Land End, Land's End, you might find, Wow, this is easy. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely hammering. I'm looking at my watch and I've done loads of distance. That was the easiest paddle in the world. And then you turn around to come back to where you've left the car and you don't go anywhere because actually you're paddling against. It's like trying to paddle up a river. You just can't do it. And so that tidal um, movement, that tidal stream or tidal flow is very important in terms of planning where we're going to go paddling. Um, the tide, when it comes in, if we think about the vertical distance, it doesn't come in at the same speed and then go out at the same speed. And I can, um, I can give you, whoops, uh, I can show you uh, what that looks like. I've got a uh, container with water in it here. And this is, let me set this up a second. Okay, so on here, this represents the vertical movement up and down of the tide. And when the tide is at high water, it's here. And at low tide, it's, it's down here. You'll notice I've divided it into 12 little sections. And those sections are gonna help me to explain how the, the difference in the speed of the tide when it's coming in might affect you when you're paddling because this directly relates to the speed of the tide around the coast as well. The easiest way to think about this is if you imagine you were um, sat on a harbour wall and it's low tide. Imagine it's midday and it's low tide. That means that high tide will be just over six hours later. So if you sat there swinging your legs off the end of the harbour wall, and you sat there until one o'clock, the amount of water that you would notice coming in would be one twelfth of the total amount of, that's coming in, total amount of water that's coming in. So that's only half a meter. But actually between one o'clock and two o'clock, there would be twice as much water that would come in, two twelfths. That's quite a lot more and so the, 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 the the height of the water is rising faster, but also along the coast, it's starting to move faster. Between two and three o'clock, actually, it's moving really quite quick. It's moving three twelfths now. 
between three and four o'clock, the middle two hours, it's still moving three twelve. So this tide is absolutely hooning uh, in. Between four and five o'clock, it then slows down and it comes in two twelfths of the total amount of water. And then the very last hour, once you sat there fishing, whatever you're doing, chilling out, it only comes in one twelfth, half a meter for that last hour of the tide. It's now high tide, just after six o'clock, and probably time to go and get fish and chips. However, if you stayed there, or you went and got your chips and you came back again, the tide would do the same thing when it goes out. It would go out slowly, faster, 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 slowly, slowly. So if we were to look at that without breaking it up, when the tide comes in, it would come in like this. It would be 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three, four, five, six o'clock, the last bit. So this tidal movement, this tidal range, it's important because you don't want to lose your stuff if you leave it on the beach. But it's fundamentally more important because that tends to correlate to the speed of the movement along the coast. So if you go paddling at a straight line off the coast and there's no wind, but the tide is coming in on the North Cornish coast, and you paddle out in the third and fourth hour, and you went in a straight line, you wouldn't go in a straight line. You would be taking in a north uh, east direction towards Bristol quite a significant amount. And if you turned around to come back again, that means you wouldn't be coming back to the beach you started from, you'd be coming back to either the cliffs or a beach much further along. So that tidal movement is, is an important consideration. So how do we find out uh, about the tide? We need to, we need to look at a tide table. And it will be online for free tend to only be for uh, the week ahead. So you can you can pay, excuse me, <coughs> oh, pardon me. You can pay for uh, uh, tides um, through various apps, or you can get yourself a tide table, which looks like this. Uh, when you open up a tide table, it has uh, for each month, it has the tides for that for that month. And, uh, at the, uh, and you need to understand that when you get a tide table, if you bought a tide table in, in Falmouth, for instance, uh, but you lived in Swansea, then the tides that are in this are for that particular port. It's for Falmouth. But if we open up the inside of the tide table, it will tell us how much time we need to add or subtract for other ports that we go to. So if we took Swansea, for instance, whatever time high tide is in Falmouth, uh, Swansea's not on there, uh, but... Uh, Bristol is. So if we wanted to know what time high tide was at Bristol, it says there we need to add two hours onto that. On the screen you should see a blown up version of it and this is what we're looking at. At low tide is at half three in the morning, that's not really relevant because we're not going to be paddling at that time, but high tide is at uh, just after nine o'clock in the morning and low tide is at four o'clock, which means that the and this changes depending on where you are in the, in the UK, but as a principle, the fastest tide is likely to be between 12 and one o'clock because they're the third and fourth hours. The other number on the side here is the height, and this is the height above what they call chart datum, which I'm not going to get into now, but it's an arbitrary figure, if you like. Okay. I'm just going to... Okay, so we're done here at lock in. I'm just going to pass on to myself for the next bit because this is a little bit about uh, checking your equipment before you go out in the water uh, and I think that's best done outside so I'm just going to let myself play here. Okay so we're done here at Loch Inch um, and uh, just going to have a quick chat about checking equipment before we go out into the water. Uh, we've got our uh, paddle board here uh, and as you can see it's an ice up um, so a good way to check with the equipment is just to start at one end and work your way down through so just checking the, the, the top of it on the deck the nose checking all the fittings and fixtures are fairly secure and as we go along the deck 
Um, make sure the handle is still attached. Sometimes these can uh, become uh, damaged uh, just over wear and tear over time. Uh, and then coming down to the back, really important is the attachment for the leash. Um, the ice up, um, the attachments are obviously glued on, so just make sure it's not starting to peel away or come away anywhere like that. Um, the, it should be inflated to whatever the uh, manufacturer's guidance are. So on this one, you can see the max uh, is 15 psi uh, at one bar. Um, and you probably want to, uh, for generally general purpose paddling, you want to have it up uh, sort of towards that area. It makes the board stiffer, uh, easier to manage, but also just remember to let the pressure out of it if you're going to be leaving it on the beach in the sun. And just making sure that uh, the, uh, the valve is secure and there's no leaks coming out of it. I'm just going to flip the, the board over. We can check the underside of it as well. So the fin, make sure the fin is secure, it's not going to come out. Um, and then just checking down, especially along the reels, any of this taping to make sure the tape isn't coming away. And when you put it into the water, a good idea to have a good look all around it, just in case there's any uh, bubbles coming out, which would uh, indicate a leak, obviously. Onto the paddle then, <clears throat> when we are using the paddle, whatever sort we're using, we want to make sure that it is fit for purpose, that it's an appropriate paddle for what we want to do, um, and that all of the adjustments are working. So uh, this is a, a sort of entry level paddle, but actually that is secure, uh, and the button is coming out, the button's not stuck inside there. Uh, the handle is adjusted to the correct size, and it's uh, sold and secure, um, and the adjustment of the blade is secure as well. And then finally, just moving on to the leash, um, we'll talk about this a bit more. This is a coiled leash, which is a good idea uh, uh, for most types of paddle boarding because it tends to keep the um, leash uh, out of the water where it can drag debris and bits and pieces. Um, but whatever sort of leash that you're going to be using, <clears throat> you need to check it to make sure, first of all, the Velcro is in good order uh, and the attachment to the ankle or to the calf uh, is in good order as well. You can see this one has a bit of material stuck to it. So if you just pull that material off, it helps to make sure it's nice and grippy uh, so it stays attached to you. And if that's starting to get damaged, then we need to replace that. And then just checking over the actual leaf it's, the leash itself to make sure there's no cracks or damages or, or breaks in it. Uh, and that's us all good to go. Okay, handing back to myself again. Um, in addition to the checking the board and the paddle uh, and all the rest of it, uh, I just wanted to, to briefly mention a, a few things about when, when I go on the water, uh, on the sea, there's a few things that I always take with me and they are um, forms of communication. So, first of all, uh, people have different ways of carrying stuff. I quite like a little uh, bum bag, which is a dry bag. It's not completely dry, actually water gets in there. But for me, I have that on my person. So if for whatever reason I keep became separated from my board, I have a means of communication which is on me. Because if I have a radio or a mobile phone and it's on the board and I become separated from the board, that's no use to me whatsoever. So a means of communication on me. Um, the options that we have are your mobile phone, uh, and that's probably the most common one. And a mobile phone is really useful, but it's only useful if you can keep it dry. And keep in mind that if you put it in like a dry case like this, and it's a modern touchscreen phone, you won't be able to use it when it's in here. So you might need to think about that. There is, um, I thought I had it over there. I, I did a, a, an expedition last uh, two years ago and got a, a, a case, a waterproof case, which clipped around my phone and I could still use the screen. It was amazing. I thought it was just behind me there, but it's not. Um, but whatever you use, uh, you, you need to keep it dry. Uh, a phone has advantages and disadvantages. Some of them are pretty obvious, I guess. The uh, ad advantage is that you can, you've got a, a list of people you can ring, you can dial 999. Disadvantage is um, you can only do that if you've got phone signal. And if you're using it for any sort of navigation, that will eat up the battery and there's a risk that you might run out of battery. The other disadvantage is that you can only phone somebody on a mobile phone if you know their number. And if you're in difficulty along the coast, the reality is that if there's a boat, a fishing boat, for instance, and it's just over there, we don't have their phone number. 
So we have no way of getting a hold of them except for waving and shouting, blowing a whistle, letting off a flare, something like that. We can't contact them easily using a mobile phone. We can dial 999, but actually in that situation, a marine VHF radio is really, really useful because a phone is used to call a person. A radio is used to broadcast to everybody within line of sight. And when you use a radio and you transmit on it, it broadcasts to, to everybody who's on that channel. And commercial vessels will always be listening to channel 16. Now, if you're using a radio day to day uh, for your normal work, you, you must have a, a marine, uh, a short range, um, a short year range license um, to be able to use it. But in an emergency, anybody could pick it up and use it. Um, to, first of all, if we turn it on, uh, it'll come on and then depend on the, the, the type of radio that you're using, there's normally a button, a quick button, which will have 16 on it. We press that, that will immediately take it to channel 16. And that's the channel that if it was an emergency, an urgent emergency, if you press and speak on that channel, any commercial vessels that are in your line of sight should pick up that message. To, to send a message is slightly different to your mobile phone in that it's a simplex system. So when you press the side button, which is PTT, press to transmit, when you press that, you can transmit, but you can't receive. So if you're using a VHF radio, when you press the button, you speak into it, you release the button, and then you can receive it. If you keep your finger on the button, you won't receive any messages. So in a, in a dire emergency where there is danger to life, then we can use channel 16 we would say mayday, 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 which is help me, help me. Uh, and we would send our message, our position, our problem, and our number of people. Uh, if you're carrying a VHF, I strongly recommend you do your VHF license course, or at the very least, get some advice as to, to how to use it so you've got confidence with it. The other thing that I carry is a, a set of flares. Uh, and this is what I carry, which is really handy because it's two flares in one but it is relatively expensive, um, but it's very handy. Uh, this has an orange flare, which is on the green bit, which is for during daytime, and that's a smoke flare. And because it's smoke, you can see it from a long way away. Um, and on the other end, it's a, got a dimpled end because this is for nighttime, and this is a, a, a red flare, so it's like a big candle. You can use a red flare during the day, but when it runs out, and it will only last for a, a few seconds, when it runs out, then it's gone. Whereas with the smoke, it lingers, you can see it for, for much further along. Again, this can stick into my uh, bum bag quite easily. The equivalent of that is these bad boys, and these are quite big to be carrying around. Um, this is a, a smoke flare, and this is a, a red pinpoint flare. Um, and uh, we're, we're thinking really about ways of getting help if we, if we really needed to, if our planning, um, if things changed or whatever. The other thing that I uh, invested in a few years ago for longer paddles, but not really, I think that all that relevant maybe for um, people just starting to go into war was a PLB. But I wanted to show it to you because more and more people are getting these. They're a really useful bit of kit. It, it, it effectively, um, you press and hold the button, um, you pull out the, this little aerial here, you pull that out, press and hold the button, and it sends a package of information off which gets picked up by satellite. That will have your GPS location and the serial number of this device. If you decide to get one of these, and they're not cheap, um, but they're very, very good. If you get one, you must register it with the Coast Guard because otherwise when the Coast Guard get that signal, all they have is a number. They have no idea who it is, is in difficulty and they do occasionally get set off by accident. So if you register and it's free to register online, um, they'll have your contact details. And the first thing they'll do is they'll try and ring you or they'll ring your emergency contact number to, to find out actually are you at sea or has this been set off um, accidentally? Okay. Oh, hang on a minute. I've lost my screen sharing. Here we go. Okay. The other thing... Um, 
that is maybe uh, doesn't really cost anything at all if you've got a mobile phone is there's a number of apps that are available that can be useful for uh, um, for planning and for again help and one of them is the RYA safe tracks I'm hoping that this will play okay for you <laughs> We've got the music, but no video. Sorry, mate. Okay, that's all right. Um, let me just... Okay. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Uh, there was always a risk because I was playing it from uh, the internet rather than from my computer. But um, the Safe Tracks is a free app you can download onto your phone. You can plan your route on it. Uh, you can update via text message to an allocated person, and you can also make an emergency call on there. There are other um, uh, apps that are available. Other equipment we might want to we might want to consider uh, are what we're going to wear ourselves. So. Uh, depending on the weather, uh, we might want a hat if it's cold. Um, I think one of the biggest considerations is whether we wear a wetsuit or we wear something else other than that. Uh, on our person, I've got a wetsuit here. And this is a, a surfing wetsuit and it's really warm and it's great whenever you're in the water. However, uh, and I'll be interested to hear like Ben's or Chris's perspective on this later on. I find that when you are in a wetsuit and you've been in it for a couple of hours and you stood, you're not in the water, but you stood on a board, it becomes pretty uncomfortable. It gets a bit chafy. If you're, if you're paddle boarding and you think you're going to be in the water a lot, wear one of these because it will keep you warm and uh, it will, um, and depending on the, on the type, it'll, it might even keep the wind off you. Um, and that's great. But if you're going out for a longer paddle, um, uh, and we're again we're talking about you know out in the lakes or, or along uh, the coastline, um, they can be a bit chafing, and so I tend to tend to wear um, often shorts in reality because the bottom part of your legs tend to get wet, uh, and then uh, and if it's cold maybe dry trousers, and then something something like this which is a a fleece over the top. Uh, a um, some sort of windproof and this is the waterproof it's a kayaking top it's got a gasket at the bottom so it, it seals really tightly around the bottom it's got waterproof seals the other thing is it's quite useful is it's got a, a pocket in the shoulder which I use for my mobile phone and um, so I've got that on me but keep in mind that if you're wearing that and you fall in the water you have no float like you would with a wetsuit uh, and I always when I'm on the coast personally I always wear a buoyancy aid anyway because I can put my chocolate bar in it I can put my camera in it it's it also keeps you warm so I uh, I wear a buoyancy aid um, something like this I'm not sponsored by that man, uh, manufacturer by the way um, but it's got big pockets on it it's got a big pocket on the back so I can carry stuff around I'm not having to attach it to my board um, and then just the last thing on that is these sort of things that I might paddle, use when I'm going kayaking, but they're useless paddle boarding, on a, especially on an ice up, because <clears throat> with a big thick um, sole, it makes it harder to balance. And then you just end up with really tight calves because you because because the, the open water is always going to be a little bit choppy. And so you don't want the, the session to end quickly because actually you're just your calves are knackered. Um, so I tend to wear quite thin wetsuit boots uh, on my feet. There's a whole host of other stuff that you, you might want to consider, and, and that is probably just outside of the scope of what we're, uh, we're trying to achieve here this evening. Okay, so we've come to the most exciting part of this presentation, and this is a quiz. If you've never used Kahoot before, uh, hopefully uh, I saw there's a message went around to download it onto your mobile device. It's really good if you got that on a different device to what you're watching this on. Um, if you have got it, if you click on it, uh, then it will ask you to enter a pin. Uh, which is going to come up on your screen now. So uh, 
when you get asked for that pin, if you just type it in, it is 629-6024. And I'm Steve Poole. And if you type that in, there's Nick is on there already. It will, you'll come up on the screen here. So this little quiz is just about what we've been talking about uh, this evening. Um, there's two things if you want to win this quiz you have to do. The first thing is you have to answer the, the question correctly. And secondly, you get more points the faster you answer it. But keep in mind that if you go too fast, if you press the wrong button, then you can't unpress it. There's going to be a question that's come, that comes up on the screen, and then the answer will be a different colour in the bottom. It'll be in a coloured box, so it could be red or blue or whatever. So you just, it will turn your phone into four colours, so you press the colour that is the correct answer. It sounds complicated, but I'm making it sound more complicated than it is. It's really not, it's really not that difficult. It should be fairly intuitive when we come up to it. We've got lots and lots of people logged in there. That's great. Uh, I'll give you a minute or two more just in case anybody else is still just tapping the number in. We've still got people arriving. This is the biggest group I've ever had on Kahoot, I think. So that's impressive. Still people joining. Okay. So make a st oh, still people join. <laughs> wow. Okay. I think we're going to make a start now. If you haven't managed to log in or you don't want to, you can do this on pen, pen and paper at home if you like. Okay. Question one. What causes wind? Time, three, two, one. Okay, so it's the unequal heating of the surface of the earth. That's it. Uh, and those of you that clicked on blue, the heat of the poles, uh, I can understand why you put that, but the poles aren't hot, although they're getting hotter, unfortunately. Uh, the most correct answer is the green one. So the scoreboard at the moment is Andy's in the lead with 88, uh, 883, and Joe is closely behind. Oh, actually, it's a joint first place. Well done. Question number two. The wind circulates around a low pressure in the northern hemisphere in what direction? Answers coming in. Seconds left. And it goes anti clockwise. It goes that way round, around the low pressure in the northern hemisphere. So Jobo goes into the lead with Dave just behind and Neil in third place. Question three true or false? Inshore water forecast is very general. It's false. So uh, that spelling of mine is terrible. Uh, the terms used in an inshore water forecast are very specific indeed. So, you know, soon, specific amount of time, the wind strength and force is very specific as well. Jobo maintains the lead. Nick's in second place now. Question four. In a weather forecast, soon means what? Wow. Okay, nearly everybody got that right. Less than 12 hours. Well done. Jobo still in the lead. That's very impressive. Question five. A sea state of moderate is what? It's not, that's not it in the picture. Three, two, one. 
It is, of course, 1.25 to 2.5 meters. I have to say, I'm very impressed for those of you that got that right. Okay, next question. Question six. Today's forecast at Cape Rat, Rat, Rattery Head. What was the sea state in the Moray Firth? You've got to be paying attention to this presentation to be able to answer this one. Okay, it was slight. It was very rough up by Orkney, but when I said Murray Firth, it was slight. Okay, next question. Question seven. What is tidal range? Excellent. Most people got that right. Is the vertical distance up and down? That's the tidal range. The height of the tide at high tide is just the height of tide. That's not the range because it's just the highest tide. Okay. Moving on. Question eight. What time was high tide this morning? We've got a tide table on the screen. What time is high tide this morning? It was at just before 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. Next question. Question nine. Using, according to the rule of 12, what is the tidal flow? When is the tidal flow off the fastest? Okay, excellent. Nearly everybody got that one right. It's between the third and the fourth R. And the last question, which channel uh, is used for international distress calling on a VHF? Ah, oh, excellent, well done everybody. So the scores and the doors at the end of that. Third place, 10 out of 10. Mike B, well done Mike. Second place, Nick. In first place. And runners up, Lisa and Sarah. Well done, everybody. Okay, so the aim of um, this evening's uh, presentation was to give you an overview of um, considerations if you're going to start going paddling in open water, whether that's sea or any expanse of water. Uh, and we talked a little bit about weather forecasting, about the tides. We put that in the context of an experience of two friends of, of mine. Uh, we talked a little bit about what equipment you might uh, take with you, especially in relation to um, communications. Um, that's everything that I had planned to, to present this evening. Um, Chris, was there any questions that have come up? Uh, yeah, we, we've answered a lot of them in the Q&A. Um, but one question that's coming up, Steve, is um, so the course that you are starting next Wednesday, um, what, what's the actual content um, for the next four, four Wednesdays? What, what are you aiming to deliver just so that people get an idea of what, what it's all about? So this session is basically a very brief overview of that. So the first session, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, tides and we're going to delve a little bit more uh, into more detail about that. What causes tides, how they affect you and uh, um, uh, uh, how to plan using tides. Uh, and then we're also going to look at uh, the, I'm going to more details about 
for instance, a frontal system, how you might be able to identify that through visual signs whenever you're down in the water, um, what, uh, how the weather is likely to change as the front goes through. Um, also a little bit about waves, uh, about how they're formed, how they propagate, how they break, how they might affect you. If you're, if you're interested in, in surfing, that's important, but also if you're traveling and journeying, then that's important as well, because you may want to avoid them perhaps. So it's really um, uh, just going into, it's, it's the same sort of content, but going into more detail. Uh, really, really, really inspiring, Steve. Um, so I hope to, hope to see a few names there that we've seen tonight, next Wednesday for us. Um, Heidi's got a question. Um, how would you give your position yeah. if you needed to be rescued on open water? Wow, that's a really good question. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you know where you are in relation to a chartered object, so if there was a, I mean, it, it, we've talked about this tides at Falmouth, so Black Rock is a, a particular feature in Falmouth and it's got two balls on the top of it and it's on the chart. If you know where you are relative to that object, you could, uh, and, and you don't have a GPS, you can, over the radio or over the phone, you can tell people where you are in relation to that object. So for instance, I am uh, approximately one mile south of Black Rock. If you've got a compass, that's easier because you can take a bearing of that object and do that. And so long as you can see, then that's a, a good way to do it. The other, op the other option is you can give your latitude and longitude. Um, and you can get that from apps like Navionics, for instance, will give you a very specific location. If you pass that onto the Coast Guard and in an emergency in the water, it's the Coast Guard who coordinate all of this. So they would be the people you would call uh, if you were in, in difficulty. Yeah, excellent. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Steve. Um, as, so as, as far as the other questions go, we, we will be able to answer some of them um, as we move on, I'm just conscious of time a little bit. Um, if you're on a tidal, Rachel's just asking here, if you're on a tidal river, what's the best type of tide to paddle on? It depends on what you are, why you're there in the first place. So if you were uh, if we think about an estuary, for instance, uh, um, which is kind of the same idea, I'm, I'm guessing, if you want to paddle uh, to uh, up a creek, for instance, and I did this during the summer, where actually I want to go up the creek and have lunch and come back again. If I know the distance and I know my average paddling speed, um, and let's say the average paddling speed is, I don't know, uh, three kilometres an hour and it's three kilometers to where I want to have lunch, then I will leave one hour before high water from three kilometers away. That way I'll have the tide taking me up and then I can sit, I can have my lunch and then get back in the water and it will bring me back again. We, we're always, we always have to work with the water and with the tide and with the environment. The, if we do it the other way around, if we paddle, we can do it the other way around. We could go, um, you know, an hour before low water and we'll paddle against the tide all the way up there. We'll have our lunch. We'll paddle against the tide all the way back down again. And it will be not particularly uh, pleasant or, or enjoyable. Yeah, thanks, um, Steve. And the final question, um, just before I give a little bit more information, because um, quite a few people are asking, how can we, how do we join the longer course, which um, okay. is by our Facebook, um, our Facebook pages. Um, Mick's asking, what's a good source for tidal streams? A tidal stream atlas. <laughs> well, um, tidal stream atlas is like a book. You can buy it from a chandlery, which is like a, 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 a booty shop, or you can buy it online. Uh, or, uh, and I have no association with this, but I've used Navionics uh, on my phone, which is an app. You do pay for it, but it is fantastic for, for planning. So Navionics it is, uh, uh, and you pay for it to use it, but you can plan a route on that. And if it takes you, for instance, I, I use it going around to Scotland. Um, if you go from the mainland to an island, it will take into account what the tide's going to do based on your estimated uh, speed. So if you were uh, averaging in that situation seven kilometers an hour and you're going to be paddling for 20 kilometers, it will interpret the fact that the tide moves one way at a certain speed and how that impacts you. And it will give you a bearing to follow with all of that information, which is pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, I, I use that. Well, as long as your battery doesn't run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I use that one myself. Um, so pretty useful info there, Stephen, an amazing insight. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And um, for those of you uh, that really do uh, want to 
join in with Steve for the next four Wednesdays. Um, if you want to enroll on that, you can do so via our WSA Facebook page. Um, if you want to watch some more webinars, we've got a Friday free webinar, which is um, going to be presented by Steve West, and it's about downwinding. So we're going to have a series of three on downwinding. So if you have any interest in that, uh, definitely watch that because what Steve doesn't know about downwinding is probably not worth knowing about. Um, and we also have all of our previous um, free webinars are available to view on our WSA YouTube channel. So if you go to our website and click on the YouTube link, you should be able to see those. And we've got some really exciting stuff coming up that we're going to be launching in December, some um, educational videos, really, really looking forward to that. So keep your eyes and ears peeled. And all that leaves me to say now is thank you very much, Steve. Once again, super, super webinar, very useful. Some great comments coming back. Um, stay safe, everyone. Happy paddling, and uh, hopefully we will see uh, a lot of you uh, next Wednesday, uh, if not before, on the, for this Friday for the downwinding. So thanks, thanks very much. Eve, good night, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much for coming along. Have a stay safe. Stay out in the water. <laughs> <laughs> good night. <laughs>